to do effective integrations and automations and those sorts of things, you don't have to have an AI behind it, right? Um, AI is really good at sifting through lots of information and understanding things that look like what it's been trained on, right? Uh, and now to be, you know, generating something like next, right? It understands the, the next thing it should be saying. So, you know, I think as you look at streamlining your business, you know, AI is really good at under at looking across all the different sources of data within your organization and helping you understand the you know potential relationships between that data or the places where it's you know it looks like it may potentially go off course right from an automation and integration perspective the the ai piece is sort of secondary right but it may point you to where you can use automation and integration to be able to uh to have an impact on the business Welcome back to another episode of the We Love to Build podcast. I'm here today with Matthew Schmidt, the founder and CEO of People Logic, which makes organizational health simple enough to be actionable. They used more insights, fewer surveys, and one score to track to measure and optimize your team's health. In this episode, we'll be talking about HR and knowledge graphs and things about automation and integration and AI. Uh, there are a few things I'd like to talk about before we get started. First is, I've been checking into the statistics and the analytics that YouTube provides, and unfortunately, 99.1% of the people that watch these videos are not subscribed. So if you're not subscribed right now, I would love for you to subscribe. It really helps the algorithm and gets me closer to that 1,000 subscriber number. We're currently at 257. We've been growing a lot faster because people have been subscribing finally, which is amazing. I'd love to get to 90%. So... Thank you very much for that and for following with us. The next thing is uh, this episode, I was supported by ChatGPT. I did something really interesting. I went to ChatGPT and I said, hey, create some questions that I could ask Matthew Schmidt. And it gave me some questions. I didn't think they were very good. So I changed the prompt and I said, hey, those questions suck. Why don't you give me questions that are unique? And it spit out some really interesting questions. I may not ask all of them. I'm going to ask some of them. So I would love for you to tell me in the comments which ones you think were mine and which ones you think were ChatGPTs. And maybe I'll prompt Matthew to tell me what he thinks about that as well. And uh, I have been recently creating other content outside of the podcast that will still be on YouTube. So look for that. I'll be talking about ChatGPT and AI and my investing philosophy and some of the recent investments I've been making and why I made those investments and things like that. So get ready for a lot of really interesting content. Now let's get on to the interview. Thank you for taking the time to talk with me, Matthew. I appreciate it. Why don't you tell everyone a little bit more about PeopleLogic and we'll go from there. PeopleLogic was created with the goal to help companies be able to grow faster with less risk uh, and really came about from being able to build a growth company, my last company, which we exited. Um, but seeing that, you know, we made a lot of missteps along the way, but had all this data in the tools we were using to be able to uh, be able to make better decisions, right? And to be able to make better decisions about our people uh, so that we could improve their engagement and their retention and their employee experience. Uh, and so, you know, we, we have been working on that mission to really be able to help HR leaders be able to get a better pulse on their organization without the need for surveys um, and to be able to have it be right in their flow of work without uh, having to continually bother to all the people on their teams to, to try to get feedback and, and insights. What were some of those missteps you made? Like most companies, we, we burned out a lot of folks um, predominantly because we weren't paying attention to where there were process inefficiencies right? Um, or where we weren't really understanding the, the true social network behind the organization. Uh, and so, you know, what that comes to, where that comes to bear is really where, you know, you have your lead engineer that's actually spending all this time helping your customer success team or your customer success teams interfacing with your sales team to improve sales and not doing the work that they should be doing or, you know, doing work in a manual way that's, you know, not creating as much efficiency uh, as they could be. And so, you know, they, that led to higher burnout, higher attrition, um, 
you know, just lower satisfaction, more uh, frustration. Uh, and, you know, with people logic, we're able to see where those bottlenecks are and where people are, you know, really, you know, spread too thin across the organization. You learned from the experience of the mistakes you made from that last business and that led you directly to making this new company? Yeah, exactly. Exactly. So, you know, I would say that the missteps that we made around our people, whether that was around their, you know, their engagement or because we lost great people that we shouldn't have lost. I, I would say those missteps probably increased our time to exit by at least two years, but possibly more. Right. And so, you know, as I was transitioning out there, I, I felt that that was a problem worth solving. That if I could help companies that were growing quickly, make fewer mistakes or to be able to get those early warning signs before they stepped on those landmines, uh, that that would be a valuable business to build. I completely agree that it's valuable to help other businesses to make better decisions. And that's one of the missions of my company we live to build. Uh, so I'm glad that we're aligned on that. You said that it took a, probably two years longer to exit do you think there was a negative impact on the end valuation? And if so, even if you don't put a specific number on it, do you have an idea of maybe the differential? We had multiple product lines, you know, two very distinct things that we sold. And, um, you know, if we had solved some of these problems, we, we could have built up the second, invested more in the second product line to actually uh, drive its revenue higher, which, you know, probably could have given us, you know, probably not 50% more on our exit, but I would imagine 30%. And typically when you're exiting, that's a huge amount because assuming you're one of two founders, that, that could be an extra few million dollars potentially in your pocket. Exactly. Right. And for our team, uh, who were also all owners, right? So there was you know, that was a, a challenge worth worth biting off. I have to make a disclaimer here now. Uh, a few days ago, I completed an investment in a brand new company that will be focusing on automation and integration and business intelligence services. So they're not a competitor to your company, but their philosophy is similar, where the goal is to streamline operations in an intelligent and efficient way. With that in mind, one of the types of businesses that I'm curious about working with and, and promoting the service to for the agency are companies that are thinking about selling themselves. The reason being is if someone's going to buy your business, they would like to inherit something that's hopefully not a mess. And generally, if you've been running a company for 5, 10, 15, 20 years, it's probably a mess inside because you probably got comfortable with the way things are working and therefore you're probably not going to get the best value for your money when you're trying to exit because there's a lot of inefficiencies. And one of the reasons why people will buy your business is because they can spot those inefficiencies and want to improve upon them. I think about it now like this. If you work on streamlining your processes, automating your workflows and integrating your different departments. When you go to sell, there's less inefficiencies, which means they can potentially have a much faster uh, growth period where they didn't have to waste six months to a year figuring out all the problems and fixing them. They know that everything is kind of working and then they can scale with it. So I think HR is a huge, huge point that a lot of company owners really ignore when it comes to you know the operations and the management of uh, how the company works so you know going back to your product i think people logic is extremely valuable in that regard and again another disclaimer this is not paid content they're not paying me to say this from the bottom of my heart with psychology in my mind and having experience as an operator and an hr manager HR is severely lacking across most companies. They generally just don't know how to take care of their people. Yeah, no, that's a that's a great point, John. And I, I think, 
like what we see routinely is, you know, HR leaders that are just so completely overwhelmed that they cannot even begin to think about how to, you know, even open their eyes to the fact that the entire industry is changing, right? 99% of them can't even get to that, you know, to where they have a moment to think about how they might take that evolutionary leap. And so, you know, we see the HR teams being responsible for everything from, you know, internal comms uh, in the business to running the all hands to, you know, setting up the offsite to benefits to, you know, laying people off to, you know, and then down in there is, okay, yeah, we also have to like make sure we take care of our people, right? And they certainly say they care about retaining people. But it's a, you know, it's a never ending challenge for, for those teams to be able to, you know, just continually keep up. How do you see AI revolutionizing the recruitment and talent acquisition process within large organizations and what specific challenges can it address? Yeah. So, I mean, talent acquisition is an interesting one and certainly there's been a ton of money even before the, the most recent advances in generative AI. Um, you know, I think we're right now we're in a really interesting place because it's, you know, we have a ton of tools for talent acquisition folks to be able to use on one side. And then on the other side, we have these amazing new tools that can create a persona of someone in, uh, in a matter of minutes, right? You want a new headshot, you upload some, uh, a couple of selfies, you, uh, you need to create a person, you want to put a blog and let's create some content making you look like a, a thought leader or, you know, you want a, a fancy new resume. Like, okay, all those things can be done in like 10 minutes or less if you know what you're doing, right? So that has to be blended in with all these new AI tools that are looking at the, you know, all these resumes that are coming in, right? And trying to, uh, help to, you know, have the talent acquisition folks be able to manage an ever increasing number of applications, right? Um, you know, I think for most organizations, the biggest challenge, particularly large organizations, the biggest challenge will just be making sure that the AI that they're leveraging really aligns with their, uh, their various initiatives, right? Because it's not simply filling the position, it's filling the position with uh, you know, meeting certain diversity metrics, for example, right? And making sure that the, you know, you're not excluding great people uh, because there still is a, you know, a human side to, to the hiring piece. Um, and I think, you know, yes, it's going to allow people to do more with less, but at the same time, you know, I think you know, going all in and letting AI decide who you're hiring is probably not going to be the right move either. I completely agree. In my last company where I had about 16 employees, we never used AI for any part of the process. We we created a funnel by hand using LinkedIn and Calendly. Well, LinkedIn and ClickUp. And then put into put it put Calendly and email and all that. Um I talked about the hiring process we used before. I'll mention it real fast, and and I'm curious to see what you think of it, actually, since you have a lot of experience in HR. Basically, what we did was we would generally post an ad that we wrote by hand because ChatGPT didn't exist yet. We, we we created the job description. We created all of the, you know, the, the understanding of where that person would fit into the company. Um, and then we would create an ad on uh, LinkedIn, and it was just a job post. We didn't actually pay for the ad because why? Give them money. And... Then we would set the region that we were looking for. So if we were looking for a developer, maybe we were looking in Southeast Asia. If we were looking for a marketing person, maybe we were looking in Europe or whatever. And the, you know, the the full job description would be there. And at the very bottom, it would go, do not click on apply through the LinkedIn button. Go to this link and fill out the form there. And it was a, a ClickUp based form. I can't tell you how many damn people clicked on the damn apply button. 
I can't tell you how many people added me or Mark, my COO, as a friend on LinkedIn. I can't tell you how many people sent us emails directly through our company emails because they scraped the data off the internet. Guess what? They all were disqualified immediately. Because our goal was, we want to hire people that follow instructions. Sure, we want them to be creative, but we want them to follow instructions first. Because if you can't follow instructions, then your creativity doesn't matter. Right? Because there's a hierarchy. At some point, you're going to have to listen to what someone else says. Fair. Then if they, if they filled out the form on ClickUp and they were a fit, we would send them an email. Now, let's say we were hiring for a marketing manager. I can't tell you how many people we got who were cooks or who were developers or who were lawyers or who were college students. So many people were not even qualified for the job. They were automatically disqualified. Of the people who filled out the form and who were qualified, we emailed them. And we simply said, thank you for your application. We're happy to do a call with you. Pick a time on this calendar. Here's the link. Guess what? So many people said, I'm available at 3 p.m. on Wednesday. Does that work for you? Disqualified. Why? They didn't listen. So if they went and they picked a time on the Calendly, guess what? We'd have the call with them. And we would ask them a series of eight questions to see you know, do they actually fit for us? Like, you know, how, how, what's your current situation? Why are you leaving your job if you have one? Uh, when would you be able to start? What is your asking salary? Well, just a, kind of a basic thing. If they were a fit, we would then send them another email introducing them to the next person. And that person would do a hiring test with them, a, a hard skills test. And if they pass the skills test, they would then go and have a final call with, you know, the, the COO and, and myself, whatever. Uh, we might have 400 applicants and only like three or four were qualified and actually paid attention and followed instructions by the end of it. It was annoying, but we got really good people because they were the only ones that survived. Do you think that's how a lot of companies do it? Or do you think that's maybe not a smart way to do it anymore? Are there tools that we can use to streamline this process without dehumanizing the process because i i i'm uh, i'm afraid of using ai in a hiring process personally a startup probably shouldn't use ai in the hiring process right the the choice and the impact of the individuals at that early stage is too important right you don't want to hand off any of that or overlook a you know a hidden gem that you know, might be a great fit ultimately, but, you know, maybe is, you know, a career changer, right? Or is, you know, changing industries or whatever, but they have good skills, right? Uh, and they can follow the process. Um, you know, so I think, you know, that process probably, you know, it's, I, I think, it, yeah, absolutely, it works. Right. Um, I think, you know, probably it reduced the volume to a place where you were able to to make it manageable. Right. Um, because I do know as soon as you have those, you know, you have the apply button and you run it through LinkedIn, you're going to wind up with, you know, you, you can wind up with 400 or 500 applicants. And then somebody's got to go through those. Right. And then you have to decide who you want to, to follow through. So, you know, when you're dealing with that kind of volume, does it make sense to, you know, at least have some tool that, you know, breaks it down into different buckets? Like I could see that like where it's a classifying sort of thing, right? So we, you know, this person has all the skills that we, uh, that we want to see and this person, uh, you know, follow the instructions and, and so on. Right. I'm not sure of the current state of the art in the, you know, in that world right now, we tend to play a little bit later in the HR stack than the talent acquisition space. But, um, you know, I think it's all about a question of volume and how many of you are trying to get through and how many on your team um, are responsible for the hiring process. What's an example of how you've helped a company to kind of transform their HR functions and, and improve the way that they manage that we have a couple of 
uh, you know, really key case studies. And the, the big thing that we tend to help them do is allow the HR teams to uh, push down some of the responsibility, some of the management of employee engagement down to the individual managers of teams to allow them to understand where they have their risk and bring that into their one-on-ones and their team meetings, and whether that's around operational inefficiencies or whether it's around the, the more human side of, you know, people being overloaded or having, uh, you know, those, you know, becoming that influencer across the organization. Um, you know, that allows the HR team to then become a bit more strategic right? Uh, instead of being constantly putting out fires. And so, you know, with that in, in mind, we, we really stay very focused on, for the most part, that, you know, the middle of the employee experience from the after they've been hired and, and helping, you know, we help to some degree to, you know, help them measure onboarding, uh, all the way through then to, you know, the, you know, just beyond where they're, you know, before they're getting ready to, to perhaps leave the organization. Ultimately, our goal is to make sure that you're keeping great people. Um, but, you know, if you've got people that aren't great fits, you need to know that too. So you're saying that your goal is to push the information down to the lowest level manager who has boots on the ground or is managing boots on the ground. But doesn't that start from the high level? And if so, how do you create a high level strategy with a company in order to enable that because it really starts from top down i think the initial place that we start within an organization is that highest level uh person uh, whether that's you know in hr typically right so we we start by working with the hr teams or the people teams and we we work with them to create sets of enablement content, right? So whether that's, you know, here's how you message this to the organization, here's how you, uh, you know, work to train the individual managers, here's our understanding of your goals for the year, um, you know, here's the, you know, your current engagement levels from your last surveys, um, and here's your, you know, your current uh, attrition level. Right. And from there, then, you know, we can work to kind of guide them through towards a, you know, a a path and a strategy that allows them to, um, to achieve the goals that they are responsible for. Right. And then we work with them occasionally on, you know, producing reports that they can use for executive team meetings and all hands and those sorts of things around, uh, some of the findings that, that we see that are useful for, you know, showcasing the fact that HR is now data driven uh, and proactive rather than simply being reactive and, and focused on compliance. How can AI be employed along this process so that what gets implemented for these people teams and these HR management teams? to be able to streamline what they do, automate what they do, integrate what they do, so that as they scale, it doesn't break and they can make sure that new teams or new people that come on get onboarded correctly and get trained correctly, et cetera. To do effective integrations and automations and those sorts of things, you don't have to have an AI behind it, right? Um, AI is really good at sifting through lots of information and understanding things that look like what it's been trained on, right? Uh, and now to be, you know, generating something like next, right? It understands the, the next thing it should be saying. So, you know, I think as you look at streamlining your business, you know, AI is really good at under at looking across all the different sources of data within your organization and helping you understand the, you know, potential relationships between that data or the places where it's, you know, it looks like it may potentially go off course. Right. From an automation and integration perspective, the the AI piece is sort of secondary, right? But it may point you to 
where you can use automation and integration to be able to uh, to have an impact on the business. Would it make sense to use this enablement content to train the AI on how it can be effective in helping the team? Or, or is it possible to maybe create an AI chatbot that would disseminate this information or make this information easily available at, at the ask of a question from someone who's being onboarded or even someone who's actually quite good already at the company? So I think that's where you're going to see a lot of the impact of AI and HR, right? Is changing, freeing up the HR business partner in particular from spending their days answering questions. Right. So when you're feeding the AI chatbot the sum of all your company knowledge, whether that's around your benefits or around your projects that are in flight or what the current OKRs are or what have you, right? Um, you know, the they can ask that at the drop of a hat from Slack or Teams or from the web. And those are um, you know, things that HR business partners and other people will no longer have to. And I think as we move forward and the bots continue to get better, that's going to free people up to do things that are more strategic, that are more focused on driving value for the business and increasing the, the value of the company. I asked you that question knowing something really interesting. So I was already aware of the answer. I wanted to see what you thought. Uh, so I'll follow that up with, I recently read about a study that was done at a company with a few thousand employees. And this company provides kind of like customer support, like it's it's like outsourced customer support, basically. And what they did was they took some people and trained them on this kind of a bot where you can constantly ask questions. So let's say, for example, you're brand new, you get a question from a customer, you don't really know the answer, you can just ask the bot and it tells you the answer like this. So they found that people who had been around in the company for one month were performing at, as well as, if not better than, people who weren't trained that way who had been at the company for six months. That's not to say that the people at six months should be fired, but to say that this kind of a tool can drastically speed up the time for training people and making them proficient at providing at least customer service support. But that doesn't mean it can't also be put into, it couldn't be trained on your technical documentation for your development team to ask questions of the back end. That doesn't mean it couldn't be put into another thing about product so that your product team could ask questions of the feature specifications documentation. There's no reason why these words on a web page or on a document can't come to life and support the development of the knowledge of your teams so that they can help each other or so that they can ask questions even between departments so that you can prevent them wasting time trying to reach out to other people. That's not to say that the communication between humans isn't vital for the development of and the thriving of a company, but when people are so burned out by meetings, these bots could save tremendous amounts of time wasted on emails and wasted on meetings. Those sorts of things, I think, make a, a lot of sense, right? A question answering is is probably the simplest place for those to to get injected into an organization and it might be that it's um you know it might be that it's about a feature spec or it might be that it you know saves engineers time because they're not being broken out of their flow to answer a question or it might be that they can speed up writing a new piece of code by having intelligent blueprints right so you know i think that there's you know, as far as efficiencies, we, you know, looking at it in terms of how can we use the question answering capabilities and the generation of uh, text uh, of all kinds to be able to, to speed things up, right? I, we already use it in the sense of being able to, uh, you know, create the initial presentations. Right, using some of these new uh, presentation generation tools that are that are coming out, right? Uh, and so, you know, when I don't have to spend time, 
you know, staring at a white set of slides, um, you know, it starts to starts to really add up. Do you think HR professionals should be worried that AI will replace them? Or do you think they should be excited that AI will allow them to do less of the menial tasks that they are currently doing in order to focus on providing a higher level function for their company? Human nature is to be fearful that they're going to take your jobs, right? Uh, that's the, whether it's AI or it's some other person, that's the, the human nature part of it. Um, the people who are growth minded and are going to be really uh, excited about the opportunity that it provides for you to do the less menial work and focus on driving value for the, for the organization. A right? uh, simple case in point, right? The, you know, I know folks that, you know, take all their notes in Notion and then Notion summarizes them and pulls out the action items, right? Um, that saves them a huge amount of time and has them be more prepared for meetings and uh, for having conversations. Right. And makes them more effective at their job. And so, and causes them less stress because they're, uh, you know, they're able to stay up to speed better with a lot of things being thrown at them. So, you know, in my mind, those that embrace the, uh, the efficiencies that those types of tools can bring and the acknowledging that it's going to make them better at their job and take away the stuff that nobody actually likes doing. Right. Um, nobody really wants to answer yet another question about benefits, right? Uh, or the 401k. Um, then they should be super excited that they get to do something that that adds more value to the org. Do you think AI has a place in performance evaluation which could lead to letting someone go or giving them a raise or giving them a promotion? And if so, what does it look like now and what should it be? How should humans work with AI or should AI have complete control? Or... That's a really difficult question, right? And it's part of the reason why we step into, you know, leveraging the latest AI very carefully, right? Frankly, because we deal with a lot of, you know, is surfacing whether someone's at risk for attrition. And we want to be, you know, pretty damn right uh, that we're not surfacing the wrong information. In performance management, you know, there let's be honest, right? That process is entirely broken, right? The current way that people do performance reviews is hugely time consuming, uh, not particularly effective, right? Filled with tons of bias. Um, and, you know, hasn't seen a major overhaul in, in quite some time, right? Now, there are some interesting companies that are out there doing really interesting things. Companies like Confirm that are using ONA to uh, kind of turn the the 360 process on its head and to save you a bunch of time. Uh, but by and large, companies are are pretty inefficient at how they do performance reviews. Right? It takes days uh, for a single manager to do that, and then it all has to be collated and, and so on. So, you know, there is, I think, a huge amount of risk in removing the human components from that process uh, by leveraging AI. Um, you know, do I think that it could, you know, you could use AI to, you know, try and score the reviews on a couple of different quadrants? Um, yes, you could, right? You could see, okay, how does this relate to, you know, alignment with our values? Right? Or how does this relate to, you know, completion of their OKRs or their their goals, right? Um, but I think, you know, offloading that from the person who's most familiar with it is, um, you know, probably going to create more problems than it's worth. Yeah, I feel like there's a huge problem there when you try to train an AI on your corporate culture and give it the flexibility to go, yeah, I don't think this person is in line with our values. How do you make that determination, right? If they hit their AK, like if you set an OKR, that's easy. Okay, did you know, their KPI, did they get five articles done a week? 
okay, yes, I've looked at the data. Yes, this, okay, yeah. Right, so if they hit their goals, fine. But determining alignment on, on values is very, very nuanced that even humans struggle with. Certainly today's AI is lacking intuition. Um, and so, you know, I think that's where, yeah, you, you'd have a real problem. Um, I think that would cause, um, uh, again, more, more problems than a word. What would you even train that on? Right. It, it's, I think is the, the biggest, the biggest challenge there. So it really, again, you have to look at it through the lens of what are you optimizing for? Uh, and I think if you're trying to optimize for, uh, you know, giving the managers time back, uh, or, you know, making, you know, reducing the recency bias, uh, that's present in performance reviews. Um, you know, you can do those things, but you just have to know what, what the ultimate goal is that you're, that you're trying to do. If you're trying to simply remove managers from the, from the performance review process, like that's not going to be super effective, but it might be effective in, summarizing the performance reviews so that the next level manager is able to um to identify the you know where they need to pay attention and drill a little deeper right that might be really useful versus you know them having to read all of the the reviews um you might find that the ai is able to suggest a a broader set of peers to provide a a 360 than simply having the person suggest things. So it, it, it all, again, it all depends on what you're trying to optimize for um, versus, you know, just simply trying to remove the manager from the, from the process. Should AI have the ability to promote diversity, equity, and inclusion? And if so, what's the best way to implement that? don't think we should be having AI making decisions for us without some oversight, right? Like right now that we're not to that place where like I would trust AI just like without spot checking it. Right. So, you know, should we let it be making decisions around the our diversity metrics, right? That's entirely dependent on, everybody's individual organization, right? You should, you know, ultimately that comes down to, okay, what is the, the shape of our organization that we're trying to achieve? But, you know, it should not be making decisions, particularly in the hiring process based on those types of things, right? Yeah. It should not say, oh, this text feels like it was written by someone who identifies as a female. Right. Like if it starts to introduce those sorts of components, um, you know, we're just setting ourselves up for a massive, uh, a massive fail. So, um, yeah, I, I think, you know, you, ha we still have a ton of work to do on making sure that, uh, we're not introducing more bias into the data sets that we use to train the AIs and, um, and making sure, you know, that we are, you know, continuing to be focused on the, you know, a fair and equitable hiring process, right? Um, and for, the truth is that most companies who are in the HR tech space don't have the resources that someone like OpenAI has to to train their content, right? And to train the AI. They, they just simply, they don't have a billion dollars from from Microsoft. Right. Uh, and so, you know, I think we have to, we just have to be really very careful when we start to let it. Off air, you mentioned knowledge graphs. What is a knowledge graph? A knowledge graph is really about, a, there's, if you sort of take it at your low level, it's a, it's the connection of all of the different pieces of, uh, knowledge that exists within, you know, in our context, we'll take it as your organization, right? And so, um, but it could be, you know, if you think about it, a, you know, organizational network analysis could be a technology graph, right? That's the graph of the people and how they interact uh, within an organization. Um, 
for, you know, one of the neat things that PeopleLogic does is it actually builds up a knowledge graph underneath the, uh, from all of the data that it's collecting across your tools of, you know, how are certain projects connected? And so not just the, or, you know, certain deals and customers and those sorts of things. And so, you know, we build not just the graph of the people and how they're connected, but it's the people and what they're working on um, and the information within the organization so that then we can start to understand the the impact to a business around certain areas. So do you think an AI would be useful in sorting through that data to make higher level distinctions that could then act like a business intelligence system to help these companies make better decisions around how the organization operates? That's sort of the foundation of the business, right? Um, so, yeah, I, I mean, AI and, and truthfully, whether it's full AI or, or more machine learning, um, those are things that businesses are good at. Right. Or that it, those types of systems are, are good at. They're good at seeing whether, you know, this type of entity is related to this type of entity because, you know, these three people all still are all working on it together. Right. Or because we extracted it from this piece of content and we know that it's over here in this system. Right. So. You know, if you feed it enough of the the data and you can understand, you know, how to structure it in a way to uh, find the interesting signals in it, then yeah, absolutely. It, uh, it can surface the information you need to make better decisions. What is your hope for the future in regards to AI in general? And then about AI in relation to the running of companies? I am generally... Uh, an optimistic futurist, right? Uh, a kid raised on on Star Trek, um, um, you know, seeing that there is a better future uh, available for us, right? So, you know, what I when I look to the future and I look to the reasons why we might, you know, invest in fusion power, right, for uh, you know better desalination or those types of things, right? Um, or AI. I look for, you know, how can it make our lives as humans better, right? How can it make our time that we get to spend on this earth or any other better, right? And make us do less of the things that, you know, really are better suited for machines, right? And so, you know, Earlier, we talked about HR folks, you know, not having to do the menial tasks because AI can make their lives better, right? That's a very specific, but very simple, straightforward thing, right? Um, you know, by having AI, you know, do some of the sort of more rote or, you know, it might be service oriented tasks out there right yes there will be jobs that are disrupted as part of that um it's on us as a society to figure out how we can help people reskill uh to be able to accommodate for that so that they can be working on their something that is more rewarding and fulfilling and more valuable so you think ai's role in our future as a species is to free us from the monotony of work so that we can live better lives. Would you agree with that? I would agree with that in my mind, right? As a, a, an optimist uh, looking at the future, right? Just like I believe that, you know, using, you know, future power technologies can save us from a world of scarcity, right? Um, those things are, are important in the ways that we that we look at how uh, the future can evolve now certainly they you know that requires us all to you know think in a similar way and to have the proper social safety nets and those sorts of things but uh, yeah my general feeling is that it can free us from doing the things that aren't rewarding some people want ai to make all of the decisions for humanity would you fear that as a potential future 
Yeah. I mean, that's pretty scary because you're asking about, I mean, look, what makes us human is free will and choice. Um, and I think to give the, to give that up to anyone, frankly, right. And whether it's AI or not is taking away what makes us human. Um, you know, I think, yes, if you're looking at it from the perspective of, okay, these are, you know, the people who are currently making decisions as representatives are filled with, uh, plenty of flaws. Yes. But our solution to that isn't to hand it all off to some AI that, uh, you know, we hope it's going to make better decisions because it's only going to make decisions based on the data it's fed to it. And if you made that decision based on, you know, even the limited history of the U S here, right. You would, uh, it's likely to make a decision. That's not, not going to be in the favor of us. How can people follow up? They can reach out to me on LinkedIn, search Matthew Schmidt, people logic, or you can shoot me an email at Matt at people Entrepreneurship is a marathon, not a sprint. So take care of yourself every day. And if you're listening to us on iTunes or Spotify, please leave us a review because it helps us to get more people to be interested in watching or listening to us. And if you are on the audio side, please don't uh, hesitate to check us out on YouTube because then you can see my beautiful face all the time.